Um, yeah, so firstly, thanks to the organizers for putting on this meeting. It's been a pleasure to come here and to hear all these talks um, and enjoy my first time at this institute. So yeah, without further ado, uh, yeah, my talk, title of my talk is Topological Phases of Cosmic Driven Quantum Matter. This is work done in collaboration um, on the theory side with Anusha Chandran, uh, David Long, and Eva Martin, and uh, on the experimental side of the collaboration, Eric Boyes, Alex Fishkov, and Alicia Collar. Okay. Okay, Do I go now? Okay, cool. Um, so maybe unsurprisingly, given the title of my talk, one of the major pieces of context I wanna draw on uh, is uh, topology and condensed matter. And so one of the uh, most well-known uh, signatures of topology and condensed matter is uh, quantized boundary modes. And the canonical example of this is of course found in the quantum enormous Hall effect, where the topological uh, nature of the material as quantized by its topological index, in this case, the Chern number of the valence band, is manifest in the existence of these boundary modes, which energetically sit in between the two bands. And in space, uh, they're found on the boundary of the system where they give rise to quantized boundary transport. Now, um, I guess one of the major breakthroughs of the last sort of 20 years was that this physics of quantized boundary modes is not just restricted to uh, 2D systems, but you can find these things in high dimensions as well. So just as an example of that, um, here's a picture of some quantized Dirac cones, which are found on the surface of bismuth selenide. So quantized boundary modes is not the whole story, of course, and certain topological insulators also exhibit a quantized bulk response. Um, ex exotic examples of this include things like the topological magnetoelectric effect or the Witten effect. Um, but again, the most well-known example of this um, is found in the quantum enormous Hall effect uh, where we have a Hall current. So specifically, if you apply an electric field to your system, you see a current flow in the perpendicular direction. And so this is illustrated in this diagram in cylindrical geometry, uh, where if I fold my Hall insulator into a cylinder and try to flux through the middle of it, I generate an electric field, which runs around the circumference. And hence I see a Hall current flow along the length of the cylinder. But there are more exotic examples of this too. Um, and one of these, the next most interesting, well, the next interesting example is potentially um, the 4D quantum Hall effect. So this can be understood as, well, the origin of this can basically be understood by stitching together two 2D Hall effects. Um, so specifically, if I have some system existing in four dimensions, X, Y, Z, and W, uh, you can imagine um, if I have the cylindrical geometry in the XC plane, Again, if I thread a flux, I'll get a uh, electric field which runs around the cylinder and a Hall current that flows along it. If I have a magnetic field, this Hall current will lead to a Lorentz force in a perpendicular direction, which I can choose to be in the W direction. And if I have a second Hall effect in this uh, WY plane, I get a Hall current flowing in the Y direction. So actually the 4D quantum Hall effect is more stable and doesn't actually require uh, the time reversal symmetry breaking. And so if I go, and uh, restore that symmetry, this effect can persist even though the two 2D Hall effects disappear. So this is all very nice, um, but an obvious question is, um, in what kind of systems can we see this physics? We're not gonna see it in any materials that we dig out of the ground because of the unfortunate reality of life being in three dimensions. So that brings me to the next piece of context I wanna draw on uh, in this sort of setting up the motivation for this talk, um, and that is uh, synthetic quantum systems. So specifically technological advances in the lab have given us access to synthetic systems, uh, which are colder, cleaner, and have longer coherence times than those that we're gonna find in nature. And so um, obvious examples of this are found in nitrogen vacancy centers, uh, in, in cold atom systems, uh, such as the Rydberg system used in the Harvard group, um, flux qubits, such as in the, uh, what's his name now, the quantum processor that Google built, and the trapped ions such as in the Honeywell H1 system. Okay, in particular, access to these uh, uh, very coherent, you know, these long-lived coherent uh, quantum systems um, has given us access to systems which are not only long-lived and coherent, but we can also address them. Um, so, ooh, sorry, actually, no, the point I wanna make here, sorry, <laughs> is that access to these quantum systems um, uh, gives us access to quantum systems whose coherence times far exceed the bare 
um, energetic scales of the system. And so this is quantitatively, this is a point we can quantitatively make um, in nitrogen vacancy centers, for example, where we have these coherence times, which exist on milliseconds, whereas the bare energetic scales of the system um, are in the megahertz to gigahertz regime. And so if I just take the product of these two quantities, we see that um, the quantum dynamics persists for uh, three to six orders of magnitude longer than the um, uh, quantum coherence takes to decay. So not only are these systems like long lived and give us access to um, long, you know, access to long ranges of dynamics in time, um, but we can also address them. And so in the context of nitrogen vacancy centers, um, this can be just by something as simple as just shining some gigahertz radiation on the system. Um, and so this opens up, so the fact that we have access to these long lived quantum states that we can also address um, in time um, opens us up to the question of what are the long time steady states of uh, driven quantum systems. Now, in order to um, get into this question, we first have to contend with another reality of life, uh, which is if you take some isolated system and you start shaking it, generically, all it's going to do is heat up. And so if you want to see something more interesting um, in the long time limit than the um, infinite temperature ensemble, then we better have a way of getting around this problem too. So that's, this brings me to the final um, piece of context I want to draw on, and that is localization protected quantum order. And it's specifically, if you can localize the system, so if it's single particle, um, just Anderson localize it, or if it's many body, many body localize it, um, you actually get around this problem. And it's basically because uh, localization removes transport from the problem, so it can't relax and it can't thermalize, and so you don't see this heating. And so this has been used um, to stabilize novel forms of quantum ordering at uh, finite energy density. And also in driven systems, it's the basic principle that's underlying um, the well-known example of the time crystal. Okay, so that brings me to basically uh, the main message of this talk, which I'll kind of unpack for you over the uh, successive slides, uh, which is that if you take an isolated quantum system and you localize it and you quasi periodically drive it, what you can actually realize is some interesting new phases of matter. And in particular, what I'm going to talk about are new topological phases. And these new topological phases actually realize some of the high dimensional topology, um, such as the 4D quantum Hall effect. And it realizes this in synthetic dimensions. So, just to unpack what that means a little bit, what I'm going to kind of be aiming at in this talk and um, if you don't follow this slide entirely, don't worry, because I'll sort of uh, introduce things over the course of this talk. But basically where this is going is I'm going to show you how if you take some system of free fermions and you have um, D spatial dimensions and N, num N independent drives, then you can actually realize a new phase of topological matter. It has some novel bulk classification, but its boundary modes actually have uh, the phenomenology of bulk classifications in n plus d minus one dimensions. So in this particular example where I have one spatial dimension and two drives, I get n plus d minus one equals two. And so my boundary modes have the phenomenology of a quantum Hall effect. And the physics that that gives rise to and what that actually means is something that I will go over. Okay. All right, so um, with that said, um, in the first part of this talk, I'll first sort of uh, explain how topological classes of dynamics emerge in the dynamics of driven quantum systems. And so in order to uh, show how topology emerges, I'll start with the simplest possible example. So the simplest system I can think of at least, well, is the simplest quantum system, is uh, a single spin or a qubit. Um, it has some Hamiltonian, which is basically described by um, a magnetic field. And what I'm going to consider is driving the system. I'm going to drive it with two incommensurate tones. And these appear at the level of the Hamiltonian as two terms, um, each of which are periodic in time, um, but they're periodic in time with different frequencies, omega one and omega two. And in order to get something new that you don't see in simple periodically driven systems, I'm actually going to omit the case where the two frequencies are equal because this just reduces to a Floquet problem. And for similar reasons, um, I'm going to omit any case where the ratio of these two drives is a rational number. And that, again, is just because it just reduces to some sort of hidden Floquet problem. 
Okay, so in order to give an illustrative example of how uh, topology emerges in the system, I'm gonna just show you a sort of uh, little numerical experiment. And in my experiment, I'm gonna consider a specific, um, a specific case of a magnetic field where I have um, one drive just rotating my system in the XZ plane a sec uh, with frequency omega one, a second drive rotating in the YZ plane with frequency omega two, and a static uh, piece of my Hamiltonian uh, with magnitude M uh, pointing in the Z direction. And as an observable in my new little numerical experiment, I'm gonna consider the rate of change of energy in the system, uh, which is just given by the time derivative of the expectation value of the Hamiltonian. Now this expands into two pieces, which we naturally associate um, with the two drives, and which we can physically identify as the power of drive one and the power of drive two. Now, if we time average these two pieces, um, they have to sum to zero. This is simply because the amount of energy in my finite dimensional quantum system cannot be asymptotically increasing or decreasing, um, but they can sum to zero in a boring way in which each of these two terms is individually zero, or they can sum to zero in an interesting way in which they cancel. Um, and I'm gonna show you that basically the dynamics of this system uh, realizes both of these cases if I play around with the value of this fixed parameter M. Okay, so just to show you, um, so I'm gonna play you two little videos. Um, each of these videos has two plots in it. Um, the plot on the left is a plot of the block sphere. So it just shows um, the state of my single spin. And the plot on the right is uh, the integrated work done by the system uh, by drive one and drive two as a function of time. And so if I set the dynamics of my system going, we see the state of the system just sort of zipping around the block sphere. And we see that the total work done by the first drive is quasi-periodically fluctuating in time. Um, but if I look on longer time scales, I see this kind of linear increase um, in time, whereas the second drive is linearly decreasing in time. In contrast, uh, if I change the value of this fixed parameter m from m equals one to m equals three and rerun my experiment, again, as a function of time, I see the state of this uh, single spin sort of zipping around the block sphere. But now I see that um, the work done by drive one is just sort of fluctuating in time. Um, and the work done by drive two is similarly fluctuating in time. But both of these are kind of averaging to zero. And so if I summarize the uh, outcome of this little numerical experiment in a plot, I can take as my uh, x-axis the value that I use for this static m parameter, um, which just described the fixed field in my model. And as my kind of order parameter, I have this uh, time integrated power um, of the first drive. And we saw that basically um, the time integrated power by the first drive was constant um, on average in the case of m equals one, whereas it was zero for m equals three. And if I go back and I repeat this experiment for many values of m, and I look at the average power of the first drive, and I you know, look in the adiabatic limit, and I take um, long time averages, and I kind of do all the appropriate averaging over initial phases of the drives, um, what we'll basically find is that um, as a function of this parameter m, this sort of order parameter just changes discreetly. So there's a region where the system um, pumps energy at a quantized rate, and a region where um, the system doesn't pump energy at all. So uh, basically what we see is that for a fixed regime, for a limited regime of this parameter m, specifically uh, where it takes values uh, between uh, zero and two, um, the total work done by the first drive is linearly increasing in time. The total work done by the second, the second drive is linearly decreasing in time. And so the result of my dynamics is just to lead to a net uh, energy transfer from the first drive into the second drive. That is, my system is acting as a little quantum energy pump. Okay, so what we found is that in one regime, we have this energy pumping at a universal quantized rate. In the second regime, we have no energy pumping. And it's just for this model where this parameter M is just setting the magnitude of this fixed field in the Z direction. So basically what's going on here and what's leading to this is um, some underlying topological considerations. And so specifically what sets um, 
the uh, rate of this pumping is the topology of the eigenstates of this Hamiltonian. So specifically, as I run my dynamics, because I'm looking in the low frequency regime, the state of my system just follows an eigenstate. Now this eigenstate lives on a torus, and as my dynamics evolve, um, the point that I'm looking at on this torus just kind of winds around and around. Um, and correspondingly, the state of my system follows some trajectory over the block sphere. But basically what it does is it samples all of this torus um, in the long time limit. And so what is actually setting uh, the pumping rate turns out to be a churn number. So specifically, because the eigenstate that my system is following uh, provides a map from the torus onto the block sphere, I can characterize it by a churn number. And it turns out that this churn number is what's setting the pumping rate. So in this topologically non-trivial phase, we have energy pumping at a quantized rate. It turns out that it's set by this churn number multiplied by the two frequencies of the drive over two pi, and is otherwise independent of all of the details of the model. And so in this sense, the energy pumping is robust. Um, I can play around with the microscopic details of the model and the value of this energy current doesn't change. Whereas we have a topologically trivial phase, oh, sorry, topologically trivial class of dynamics where there's no energy pumping. Oh, no. So I'm going to maintain the quasi-periodic structure of the Hamiltonian, but I'm going to allow, you know, any, set, any Hamiltonian that respects um, that is period, quasi-periodic with these two drive frequencies and acts on my spin, basically. Yeah. Besides ratio of omega-1 mapping, yeah. from one product to other, you validate the mapping. The mapping from what to what, sorry? The, in the previous function, you had a mapping from the, the state of yeah, yeah. So this homotopy mapping doesn't depend on ratio. No, no, exactly. Yeah. So the frequency is just to determine the way in which you sample this this torus. Okay. So basically, what we've done here is looked at a problem um, in zero spatial dimensions and two drives. Um, we've seen that um, the system behaves as a topological energy pump. Um, this is determined by the churn number of the instantaneous eigenstates of the Hamiltonian, and there's a quantized energy current when the system's in an eigenstate. So um, I could also consider the case of one drive and one dimension. In that case, um, again, what you basically do is you swap one of the drives for um, a crystal momentum, and uh, this basically co this effect corresponds to the Thales pump. Again, I have a churn number. That churn number sets the quantized particle current when the system is prepared with a single band field. And of course, if I swap both drives for spatial dimensions, then we have a churn insulator in which we have a Hall effect where there's a quantized energy current when a single band is filled. Okay, so this whole kind of formalism is straightforwardly generalized um, to classifying the states in N plus D dimensions. Um, so specifically you have uh, D spatial dimensions and N sort of synthetic dimensions. Uh, which are uh, given rise to by the drives, and you can develop a game of classifying the states uh, of these systems. Now, if you're sort of unsatisfied with referring to a periodic degree of freedom in my system as uh, a synthetic dimension, I'll just emphasize that um, there is indeed a dual picture to this K omega T torus that I introduced here, um, where I look in real space where I basically Fourier transform the whole problem, I look in real space and um, so-called synthetic dimensions uh, where um, indeed I find a hopping problem um, and I associate hops in those synthetic dimensions with exchange of photons between the system and the drives. Okay, so basically we've seen that there's a topological classification for the dynamics of uh, few level quantum systems. This applies in the low frequency limit um, well, in the low frequency limit, the lifetime is infinite for generic models, and this whole framework is robust to perturbations. Um, but if I go to finite frequency driving, we can construct certain uh, critical models uh, where this effect lasts indefinitely long. But generically, we find that it lasts for a time which is uh, only exponentially long in the inverse drive rate. 
Um, and the physics that gives rise to this finite lifetime is basically Landau Zeno excitation. You prepare the system in some instantaneous eigenstate, you let the dynamics run, and eventually it will get excited um, into a different state. And the way you construct these critical models is uh, using the um, counter diabetic driving thing that Dries introduced in the first talk this week, um, which basically cancels off these terms that give rise to Landau Zeno drive, sorry, Landau Zeno excitation. Okay, so we need to do some more work if we want to stabilize this effect and see it in, um, and see this pumping effect last uh, for infinitely long. Okay, so that brings me to uh, the next section where I'm going to introduce how we use this basic effect to build topological phases of driven quantum matter. So in the course of this section, basically what I'm going to do is show how we can use the basic phenomenology of this uh, pumping effect that I introduced here to develop a uh, phase of matter where this effect is observed on the boundaries and we have a novel classification in the bulk. So uh, basically, if I return to my spin, um, we have quantized energy pumping between these two drives as mediated by the spin in the adiabatic limit. Uh, what I'm gonna do is basically uh, just stretch that picture out and identify the top of this picture with the first drive, the bottom with the second drive. Um, now, if I prepare the system in one of the instantaneous eigenstates, um, it has churn number, say, equal to one, I get pumping in one direction. If I prepare it in the other one, I have churn number equals minus one, I get pumping in the other direction. And the way I basically understand uh, the finite lifetime of this effect is that these two modes sort of mix together and you produce two uh, states which characterize the infinite time properties of the system, both of which have churn number zero. Now, in order to make further progress, I'm actually going to switch to a fermionic representation of this system. And so instead of having this spin driven by a magnetic field, I'm going to imagine I have a spinful fermion driven by a magnetic field. And so I'm just going to swap my little spin for a fermionic orbital. If I put, if I occupy the up spin, I'm going to draw an upper arrow on it. Um, if I occupy the downspin, I'm going to draw a down arrow on it. If I occupy one of these modes, I pump in one direction. If I occupy the other mode, I pump in the other direction. And again, I expect that um, in the long time limit, these two modes will mix together and this effect will be finite lifetime. And so the basic idea is that if I take, is the basic idea that I'm going to appeal to is I can build a um, coupled wire construction out of these of many copies of the system. And so if I take lots of copies of these system, um, they might have different occupation numbers and stuff. But the idea is if I couple them together, if this coupling is very weak, it's not gonna change very much. And what's gonna happen is that um, my system will still not pump in the infinite lifetime because the forward pumping and backward pumping modes on a site will just mix together. Um, and that will lead to a trivial phase which just exhibits no interesting topological dynamics. If I make this coupling strong enough and I couple these modes in the right way, uh, basically what will happen is I'll mix cross sites instead of uh, within a site and I'll make the bulk into a topologically trivial sort of non-pumping, fairly inert, uninteresting phase. But I'm left over with these boundary modes on each end of the system, one which pump pumps energy from uh, the first drive into the second drive and the other which pumps in the opposite direction. Now, in order to get these um, modes to uh, be stable, we basically need to localize them. In topological insulators and static systems, the edge modes are exponentially localized, and this is because they essentially, this is because they essentially sit in the energy gap. Now, there's no notion of energy gaps in a quasi positively driven system, uh, because basically by exchanging photons with my two drives, I can make up and I can get arbitrarily close to any energy. And so I need to appeal to some different physics in order to localize these boundary modes to the edge. And so what I'm going to appeal to is uh, Anderson localization. So specifically, if I introduce sufficiently, well, if I introduce in one dimension any on-site disorder, I'm going to cause the system to localize. And this localization will cause all of the modes in the system to just be exponentially localized, um, including the boundary mode, which is now pinned to the edge of the system. Now, the way that I would see this boundary mode, the way that I would see the physics of this boundary mode is if I occupy all of the orbitals near one boundary of the system, then I'm going to occupy one of these boundary modes and not the other. 
And so I'll just see the physics associated with um, the boundary mode on say the left side of the system. No. And basically, uh, I guess the argument there will, would be um, appealing to the synthetic dimensions picture is I can, out, you know, in the worst case, I can just understand it as Anderson localization in some higher dimensions. And, Yeah, indeed, indeed, indeed. So the, the way to understand it would be that like, if I Fourier transform this whole picture into the time domain, well, sorry, into the frequency domain, I just have a hopping problem now in three dimensions and in three dimensions with sufficiently strong disorder I can localize. Now, it actually turns out to be simpler than that because I'm always stark localized in one direction. There's a lot of extra details in this picture. So it kind of behaves like 2D, um, but... Yeah, yeah. So you have disorder in one direction and you have like kind of quasi periodic disorder from the fluctuating heights of the different orbitals in the other directions. So I don't know, we can unpack this, but basically, yeah, the localization survives is, is the short answer to the question that you asked. Yeah, you have indeed. So I guess in In the single spin case that I introduced earlier, you know, you have like two drives, you have a lattice of sites, you have an, an electric field which is set by the strength of your two drives, and then you're asking, can you delocalize in the perpendicular direction? And because, because there's no, because these are irrationally rela related, there's no resonances along this line, basically. So. And then this, this picture basically generalizes to high dimensions. Um, so, Yeah, so you get you basically get quasi periodic disorder in the other direction. Now, quasi periodic models don't quasi periodic disorder doesn't have to lead to localization, but it generically does. And it's only when you have special things like dualities that you actually force it to delocalize. Okay, cool. Um, okay, so you can construct these models in a, in the numerical experiment. Basically, I won't go into the details of the model; they look like a mess. Um, but basically, you have some fermionic chain. Uh, you have disorder, you have quasi-periodic driving, um, and indeed, if I go and occupy all the orbitals of uh, my system on one boundary, and I let the dynamics run, I'll see that the total work done by the system, or the total work done by, say, the first drive, is just linearly increasing in time. If I flip my initial condition to occupy the boundaries, on, occupy the states on the opposite boundary, um, the work done by the first drive is linearly decreasing in time, and if I increase um, some parameter in my model that takes me into the trivial phase, you just see um, an absence of energy, any energy pumping by the system. Um, in addition, there's a, a bulk invariant, um, and you can basically understand this bulk invariant as sort of tracking the circulation of energy uh, between neighboring sites. So it's sort of like Fermion goes up in energy, goes across to one a neighboring site, goes down energy, goes back to the other site. Um, and this basically shows up formally in a generalized Flicquet decomposition where I associate this winding number to some properties of this uh, micro motion operator. Okay. So um, we can ask about the stability of this whole problem. Uh, to interactions. Um, so one of the key ingredients that I appealed to was of course the system was localized. Now, if I introduce many body interactions, um, we basically expect that either the system will thermalize or many body will remain many body localized. Um, I'm not gonna get into the, the ongoing discussion of whether or not many body localization um, persists in the thermodynamic limit. But instead what I'm gonna do is address known instability mechanisms that we have a handle on um, those are specifically runaway resonances 
and quantum avalanches. And so we looked at all of these cases. Um, and if I summarize our understanding, um, basically I can make a table where I have the number of spatial dimensions for the system and the number of drives. Um, now the canonical cases that are of course most well studied occur in the absence of driving. So for one spatial dimension, uh, we have many body localization. I suppose actually both of these results are due to the and Hevenus. But in um, one spatial dimension, we have many body localization provided that the localization length is below some critical value and uh, in two dimensions or higher, were unstable due to uh, these runaway quantum avalanches. Now, in, um, in the periodic case where I have one drive, uh, basically you have Floquet MBL, it has the same stability conditions as um, normal MBL, at least with regard to these instabilities. Um, and in dimensions higher than one, basically it doesn't matter how many drives you have, you're always gonna be unstable. Um, what we did was looked at higher cases, cases with more drives. Um, what we found was that for two drives in one dimension, you have MBL that remains stable, uh, provided your localization length is below some smaller critical threshold and um, for three drives or greater, you basically find that MBL falls apart. And the basic picture of what's going on in these things is that in addition to these thermal regions in the, within the localized phase expanding in real space, you also have some expansion in these synthetic dimensions. Now, in these synthetic dimensions, the system, the system doesn't behave as a many body system in N plus D dimensions because these synthetic dimensions are like single particle like, that is, it's sort of like, a tensor product, you know, have a copy of my system sitting on each one of these sites and I sort of hop between them. Um, so the expansion in the synthetic dimensions isn't as terminal for the fate of MBL as expansion in the uh, real dimension, but basically by competing between these synthetic dimensions. Um, you know, by seeing how localized I have to be in real space in order to compete with the expansion means in these synthetic dimensions is how uh, we obtain these uh, sort of renormalized uh, critical values of the localization link. Okay, so um, summarizing the content of this talk, I guess, um, I showed you how we can construct a topological phase. It has a bulk invariant. Um, it has some boundary modes, uh, which have this topological pumping effect. You can straightforwardly generalize this to higher dimensions. Uh, so this is new in the sense that it's, it's, it's an outside of equilibrium classification. These topological phases don't have any uh, analogous phase in the classification of static systems. Um, it's a dynamical phase of matter in the sense that it's not fine-tuned. I can go and introduce generic perturbations to the system as long as I respect um, the quasi-periodicity of the system. So as one way pointed out, I can't go and introduce extra drives and things like that. But as long as I leave the number of drives alone, um, I can introduce arbitrary perturbations. Um, and the pumping effect is non-adiabatic and infinitely long-lived uh, and robust to interactions. Um, in terms of an experimental outlook, um, we've worked with Alex Sushkov and Eric Boyers um, to basically realize this single particle physics of pumping in a single uh, qubit. Um, and basically, um, you know, it's a good qubit, so you get what you look for. Um, uh, for the right parameters, you can see that this churn number takes uh, the quantized value, which is topological. Um, and outside of that regime, you get this uh, absence of pumping and hence absence of uh, churn number. So also working with Alicia Collar uh, to realize this in a cavity QED setup. So specifically, if I take one of my drives and I quantize it, so I swap it from some you know, microwave that I'm shining on my NV center or whatever for uh, a genuine uh, quantum cavity, I have a periodically driven system where the periodic dynamics of my qubit basically pump photons into uh, the cavity. And uh, we showed in this paper that this leads to pretty good uh, Fox states in the cavity. Um, but there's no current ongoing experimental work to uncover these uh, Anderson localized topological phases that I introduced in the second part of this talk. So that's of course something we'd like to look at in the future. Um, in terms of theoretical outlook, the classification that I introduced um, has a straightforward generalization to models in uh, N plus D synthetic dimensions where 
as before, n is my number of drives, and d is the uh, spatial dimension of my hopping model. Um, and so you could generalize this to realize things like the 4D quantum Hall effect that I introduced at the start of this talk. Um, so what we've looked at in our work is always is basically the class A symmetry uh, group of um, the topological classification. Um, and all of these systems map onto a Hall effect in n plus d minus one di dimensions. And so for n plus d even, you don't see anything. And for n plus d odd, you have uh, this Hall effect associated with the boundary modes. Um, there's a lot of open questions, I guess, or you know, things left to investigate here. Um, specifically, the kinds of symmetries that you realize in these systems are quite different from the symmetries that are natural in condensed matter systems. So specifically, um, you might, you know, symmetries that relate different points in k-space basically re relate different points in time. Um, if I swap those for synthetic dimensions, those kinds of symmetries are quite unnatural to say that there's some symmetry that relates um, your, you know, your driving protocol at different points in the period. Um, so the kind of symmetries that are natural in these systems are different. So there's quite a lot of things to work out with how um, adding symmetries to the system goes into this formula. In particular, um, there's a whole set of space-time symmetry groups which describes the kind of symmetries that are natural in driven systems. And so looking at how they play into this whole physics uh, would be interesting. And indeed, there's how other topological phenomena that are what you know, we know from physics um, appear in this kind of analogy between uh, synthetic and real dimensions. And then lastly, of course, there's the universality class of the transition between them. Uh, we looked at this briefly, um, and it's consistent with chalker coddington Now, for the system we were looking at was, again, this thing that maps onto uh, the quantum Hall effect in synthetic dimensions. And so um, there's an obvious reason why, you know, it's intuitively obvious why we checked to see if it was consistent uh, with chalker coddington but we don't really have any deep theory um, for understanding how this emerges. And so there's questions there to answer about um, whether transitions between these topological and trivial phases in these systems um, have different properties to those that we find in static systems. Okay, uh, with that, I guess I'd like to thank my collaborators um, on the theory side and the experimental side and say thank you to you guys. Thanks for the nice talk. So maybe I missed a point, but uh, uh, let me just make sure. So did you define your churn number in the space of omega one and omega two? It was, I guess I can jump to the slide. Yeah, 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 here. Yeah, so in this simple example, um, where I just look at the adiabatic limit, for example, I have a quasi-periodic Hamiltonian. So it's periodic with respect to these two uh, drive phases. And so the eigenstate is also going to be periodic with respect to these two drive phases up to a gauge. Um, and so these, this is the torus on which it's, it's kind of like a two-time torus that my, or, or the torus of drive phases is the torus that I was considering. And so it's this which my state lives on. And then, yeah. But I'm just wondering if there's anything like the, you know, the definition of the original Chan number, you know, for which we have a, you know, k space integral expression, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. So indeed, it would be like the integral of the Berry curvature of this state over this torus. So I can I can define so, derivatives of this state. But uh, if that's the case, you need to derive the omega one and omega two derivative, right? Right, so you need to take a derivative of phi with respect to. Well, I, need, I, need, I need to be able to der take derivatives of my Hamiltonian with respect to the two drive phases and ask how the eigenstate changes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Okay. But that's, yeah. If you know if you know what your model is, this is like a very feasible thing to do. Mm -hmm. yeah. okay. Thank you. Yeah. So, uh, so you're trying to stabilize this state using a MBL, but. Uh, if, I, if you have a, a printer pass mm. and uh, have a steady state, uh, do you still have this uh, topological state in the interaction system? So 
also, also made it with the simplest uh, one spin case. But they still have the frequency conversion there. So, okay, the first part, I'll ask you what the second part of your question was again. Uh, um, where's my sister? Oh, just use this. Um, so, if I couple, so if I have many body interactions and I couple my system to a bath, I should expect that it just thermalizes. And so in the long time limit, I wouldn't see, expect to see anything. In the absence of many body interactions, so where I've got this Anderson localization, um, I guess you should probably expect the same thing, to be honest. Yeah. Actually, no, it's going to depend on the nature of the coupling to your bath. So then, you know, the nature of it in the single particle case where I haven't got interactions between my fermions, um, it's going to depend on the kind of steady state that your dissipation favors. And it may be that it just biases you towards, you know, if it's very weak, it might just perturb your steady states a bit, but kind of leave the overall structure of the system the same. In the clean limit, do you still have it? Clean but open. Oh, in the clean limit, well, so I need to appeal to something to bind these, these modes to the edge of the system. And so I use Anderson localization. So I would expect in the clean limit, if I turned off the disorder, that these topological modes would just sort of diffuse into the system and away from the boundary. Thank you. So uh, you want the two frequencies to be irrationally related, yeah. but of course we know that you know we are going to approximate that by a rational number. Yeah, yeah. So how stable is your topological pumping to the fact that eventually you know these frequencies are rationally related? So yeah. Uh, so yeah. Well, okay, <laughs> not all numbers are eventually rationally related. But, um, I guess the okay. If I pull up my picture of a torus again. So if, if I didn't have an irrational relationship between these two numbers, I would basically expect that I don't sample this torus everywhere. But if, if they're you know, far from a one-to-one -one ratio, so the sampling is, is for example, like very fine, but there's some finite gaps in it, I would expect to still see some of the physics I talked about, but say that the pumping effect would not be quantized. And that would be basically because instead of taking the integral of the you know, when I appeal to the relevance of this churn number to uh, the physics of this problem, it's basically because I sample all of this torus. And so if I just sample part of it, I'd say be restricting the uh, integral of some Berry curvature to some line that kind of winds around the torus. And then, you know, the integral of the Berry curvature over part of the torus is not quantized. So you just expect to see some pumping effect with a non-quantized value. Right, right. I was just wondering, like, uh, there is generally a sort of uh, a way to get better and better uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. approximations, right? So is there a sense in which uh, you know what's the error uh, that's coming to the, uh, yeah, you know, the, the integer charge, charge pumping or something? And, you know, is there a way to quantize that? Or is there a way to quantify that, you know, if I have approximated up to this order, this is kind of the error that I... Yeah, you'd expect the convergence to be um, exponent. You know, if, if, for example, you're looking at Fibonacci, you know, the golden ratio, um, and, you know, to say the ratio of these two drives is uh, the golden ratio, and you approximate with the ratio of Fibonacci numbers, then you'd expect, you know, the effective churn number, or whatever you want to call it, this integral Berry coach over, over a line, to be quantized to an amount which is exponentially small in the index of your Fibonacci number. I guess in a way that's sort of like standard. Yeah, yeah. It's not uniformly distributed, but you imagine there's some scale to the structure, and once you go below that scale. Say that again. The integral over the Berry curvature kind of becomes redundant. Becomes redundant. Oh, yeah. So you're saying if this thing doesn't have smooth derivatives, I have a problem. No, no. Is I, that what you're saying? I'm saying quite the opposite, actually. In, in there are cases, for example, in Aubrey Andre model, yeah. if you calculate the Berry curvature and you put the 
irrational number in there as a flux, then the Berry curvature is becomes independent of one of the directions, basically. Independent of? One of the integrals. Okay. So variables of the integral. So you're saying it becomes a function only of one of the indices, yeah. like theta one instead of theta one. The Berry curvature itself becomes uh, yeah, yeah. Self, okay. yeah, yeah. So self-sampled, basically. So you're saying the band becomes flat in one direction. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Then you have to only sample one point. Yeah. Um, so you're saying in that case, I wouldn't need to sample the whole torus in order to sample. Yeah, so I guess like, yeah, you can of course construct special models where whatever path you choose to take over this torus still has quantized value. But I guess that would be perturbatively unstable. Yeah, I don't know how this translates into the temporal yeah. quasi-periodicity, but in spatially quasi-periodic yeah. models with topology, integral over one of the directions yeah. sort of becomes redundant. Right, right, right. Like basically, it's like the if you like see the polarization along the direction, it becomes like a straight line. Yeah. So you just need an infinitesimal. You can take a local derivative at one point and get gives you the churn number. Okay. So. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. I guess we didn't see any examples of that in the kind of models we looked at, but I'll take your word for it. Thank you.